Well, we want to welcome you to Al Memorial Baptist Church this morning. I'm very excited uh, to begin this Christmas uh, series for the next four weeks. Uh, my goal, our approach this season is for us to take time and focus on who Jesus is, what he did, and the power of the virgin birth. Amen. And as we do so, I believe God is going to expand our hearts to know him more intimately because we have come to worship him. Uh, this title of the series is taken out of Matthew chapter 2. If you would open up your bulletin, you'll see there in the notes section there is a series of verses that's going to be uh, these guideposts for us this morning. You can follow along on where we're going to be next by looking at those things, at those verses there in the center section. Our main passage is actually out of the book of Psalms, but our title for the series is from Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, when the wise men came to before King Herod, and the scripture says this, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw that his star, and as it rose, and we have, and let's say this all together, we have come to worship him. So why are we here this morning, church? We are to worship him. And what I love about these wise men is that they came not to get something from Jesus, but they came to worship him. In this part of the world, in Christianity, specifically in America, I believe, unfortunately, the formula that we use is that God exists for us. That we... We do church, our faith, everything that exists is for the purpose of us. We are the center of the universe, and we act that way. It's almost like, like God is this, this genie in a bottle, and if we, and if we rub it, God's going to pop out and say, hey, I'm going to give you three wishes today, and if you... What is it that you want to that what is it you want and I will give them to you or is this cosmic coke machine and if we insert our quarters if we push the button if we say a prayer if we do our devotions if we make a post that looks spiritual on Facebook if we do something nice to someone or the fact that we don't flip out on somebody today then God is required to answer our prayers because he exists to make my life better but the reality is, is that we're not the reason why God exists. He does not exist for us, but we exist for him. We're created to glorify him, to worship him, to make him known, and to bring him honor. And I'll be real honest with you right now. As a church, I believe that God wants more of us from our hearts toward him in worship you know i talked to matt about about selecting songs for worship i say matt you know there's a lot of good christian songs out there but we got to be careful just because they named the name of jesus doesn't mean that we're worshiping him in that song and we got to make sure that we pick songs that worships him and isn't for us as your pastor i would say this i think we're doing great as a church as a body of Christ, but honestly, I believe one of the greatest areas that we need to grow as, as a church, and not just our church, but any church, is that we can improve and learning, not just on the weekends, but seven days a week, we are to be worshipers of him, amen? Worship isn't something we do, a worshiper is who we are. I'm going to say that one more time, I believe it's up on the screen, right? Worship isn't something that we do. A worshiper is who we are. We're created to worship God from the depths of our heart. Amen? And so for the next few weeks, I, wanna, I want us to really ask that God would build within us a desire to know him intimately and to worship him passionately. This is a great season for us to be asking these questions. Not only, just because 
not only because it's, it's what the church does, but nationally, there is a little bit more awareness towards spiritual things. Would you agree with that? And so this is a perfect season for us to examine, for us to bring up God in conversations and for us to seek to become worshipers. So we're going to look at four different postures of worship over the next four weeks. Uh, Next week, we're going to talk about bringing our gifts. Bringing our gifts. You know, ultimately, we we read Scripture specifically in Romans that our gift is our life that we can give. Then we're going to talk about pouring out our hearts, and then on Christmas Day, we're going to talk about bowing our knees. But this morning... We're going to talk about lifting our hands. We're going to talk about lifting our hands, which in this church, in this Baptist church, it's going to be a little weird, right? It's going to be a little weird. Here's what I want you to do this morning. Go ahead and take a look at your hands. Would you just hold your hands out in front of you? and Would you just look at them? Okay. Hold your hands out and look at them. If you're sitting by someone, look at their hands. Okay. Now, there's a lot to be said about somebody's hands, right? Uh, there's some there's some men that that I know that when I shake their hand, their hands tell a story, right? They're hard workers with their hands, right? And I, <laughs> I I'm I'm just imagining us holding out our hands and then like a visitor coming in through the back door and we're just like this, right? Um, for some of you. Uh, who didn't grow up in church or hasn't been around church much, I can just imagine that feeling. Even if you were to walk in through a worship service and there's a couple that has their hands going, right? And there's a couple that's like this. There's some people that are just rocking back and forth like that. Uh, Isn't, isn't, and and I I don't mean to uh, pin anybody out, but watching someone raise their hand to worship is kind of like watching someone kiss, right? You understand what I mean by that? You know, I mean, it's, I mean, you know it's real, they're doing it, and it's okay to do, but you just kind of feel a little weird watching them do it, right? Uh, and that's kind of how it is with raising your hands. Uh, you know it's real, and it's real for them, but you don't know how to look at them while they're doing it, right? I want to say this, Scripture teaches us to lift our hands to God, and we're going to find out what exactly that, that accomplishes. Remember about a month and a half ago, we showed a video clip from Tim Hawkins. Anybody remember that? About worshiping, you know? And you remember the different ones he said? He says, some people, like, I'm carrying the TV. Well, it's like the 48-inch, right? Okay, you remember the one where he says, my fish is this big? If you lie, just a little bit bigger, right? If you're a sports fan, victory, goalpost. Right, the women washing the windows. That's how they do it. And I think this morning, maybe some of you are thinking that we're just going to talk about that this morning. And uh, we're not just going to talk about that with raising our hands. But we're going to talk about worshiping God. We're going to talk about worshiping God. It's not what we do. But it's who we are. We are worshipers. Here's a question. Are you afraid to raise your hand? Are you afraid to raise your hand? And why is that? This morning, I want us to look at Scripture and allow the Scripture to come to life to us. And as we seek Scripture and seek to understand it, and what are we to do with our hands? And I believe our hands, what we do with our hands, is actually a reflection of what's going on in our heart. So let's go ahead and start out in Psalm 63. Uh, You can follow along in the bulletin there. You can open up your Bible. If you didn't bring a Bible, there's one right there in the pew that you can use right there as well. But Psalm 63. This is David, the great psalmist. He's in the wilderness when he's at a very low point in his life. And it's important that we understand that this is a very important, that he was at a very low point in his life. In verse 1, 
David cries out to God as a reflection of what many of you may feel even this morning in your hearts. He says, you, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. And in a dry and parched land, and I know what that means right now, right? In a dry and parched land where there is no water. I wonder right now how many of us are in this place in life where this kind of reflects our current situation. It feels dry right now. We feel like we're in a desolate place. We feel alone and we feel rejected. Oftentimes we feel afraid and we're saying to ourselves, I didn't think life was going to turn out like this. I didn't think I'd be at this place right now in my life. I'm going into the holidays and during Christmas time I see a lot of people very, very happy. But I'm not doing very, very good. Holidays, especially Christmas. Isn't Christmas like a magnifier? Christmas is like a magnifier. When things are going good at Christmas, they are going real good. But the opposite is true. When things are going bad at Christmas, they're going really bad. David's crying out, I need you, God. From the depths of my soul, I thirst for you. I long for you. I crave you. There's nothing on earth that satisfies me right now. I desperately need you. And he says this in verse 2, I've seen you in the sanctuary, and I've held your power and your glory. And then in verse 3, he says, because of your love is better than life. And I believe this is where theology becomes reality and is very practical. The love of God is better than life. The love of God is better than life because he's eternal, because he's everlasting, because it never fails. This life will fade away, but God's love will never fail. Amen? Your love, O oh God is better than even living. So he says, it's better than my life. Therefore, because of that, because of who you are, your unchanging nature, nothing takes you by surprise. We don't get a teenage God. We don't get an immature God. We get God who is God, who was God, is God, and forever will be the same God. Therefore, my lips will glorify you. I can't stop it because of your love. It's that good. I've got to proclaim your love, Noel. I get to go tell you that I need you. And then he says in verse four, this is awesome. I will praise you as long as I live. Now remember, he's in a bad spot, right? That's what we started off with in the context. David is in a bad spot, but he says this. I'm thanking you because of the things are good. I'm thanking you because you are still good. Even though my circumstances are not, I am thanking you. And then watch this. He says this, in your name, what will I do? I will pray and I will lift up my hands. I told you uh, portions of my story, my salvation story before. When I became a fully devoted follower of Christ, I didn't grow up in a Christian family per se. Uh, both my mom and dad were uh, proclaim, proclaiming Catholics. However, uh, we didn't, we didn't, I don't ever remember going to Mass with my parents. My aunt took me one time, uh, but I do not ever remember going to church with my mom and dad uh, while they were still married. My parents were divorced <clears throat> when I was in the third grade. 
My fam- uh, their families lived on literally two different sides of the continent. So my dad's family all lived up in Michigan. My mom's side of the family lived down in the Southwest in New Mexico. And so I bounced back and forth between the two. In my sophomore year at high school, my, did, my dad did come to trust Christ as his Savior. And it was in then, about 91, 92, that I attended Antioch Baptist Church with my dad. And I became pretty involved with, uh, with the youth group there. However, my junior year, beginning of my junior year, him and I got into a really bad fight. And I moved in with my older brother. And then in my senior year, because I got in trouble with the law in my junior year, my senior year, I ended up moving in with my mom down in New Mexico. And it was a year after my senior year, I was living with another family relative. It goes to tell you how well I was making good choices in my life. Um, It was my fault that I was moving around so much. So a year after high school, I was living with my cousin, and I decided one one morning, one Sunday morning, that I was going to go to church. I had been working across the street from this place called Bible Baptist Church, and I had seen the sign out by the road. It was a church that was off the main road, but I saw the, the big sign on the outside of the road, and one Sunday morning, I said, I'm going to go back to church. I was there for three Sundays, and on that third Sunday, the pastor had presented the gospel very clearly, and at the end of his sermon, he asked us to respond to the gospel. He asked a question that many of you heard yourselves. He says, if there is anyone here today that would like to place their trust in the personal work of Jesus Christ, would you just raise your hand? Would you raise your hand? At that moment, I I remember like it was just yesterday. At that moment, I remember just becoming overwhelmed with the reality that I have been messing up my life for at least four years. I had been making choice after choice after choice after choice that was all about me, nothing about anyone else. I knew without a shadow of a doubt that I was a sinner and that all that came flooding in at one time. And this is the part that's all God and is nothing but me. That's nothing of me. Even though I felt the weight of be, being a sinner, I understood clearly for the first time in my life that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins so that I be me be right with him. It had nothing to do with the fact with my ability to make myself right with God. It had everything that had to do with the fact that I understood that that's why Jesus Christ died on the cross was so that I may be made right before him. And when the pastor asked, he said, is there anyone who would like to place their trust in the work of Jesus Christ and his work on the cross and his power to save you? Would you raise your hand? I'll tell you, there was only one response of worship that I could have made at that moment. And that was raising my hand. I think this is important for us to ask this. You cannot <clears throat> you cannot experience the grace of God without showing gratitude in some form or fashion. You cannot experience the grace of God, and for you to simply sit still. It has to come out. And when you truly understand who he is and what he's done for you, you will want to express your heart and worship for him. That's what happened to me at that very moment. It was an act of worship. In fact, I want you to read uh, from the New Testament Paul's actually giving Timothy, his young and up-and-coming pastor that he was training, 
for ministry. Paul's giving Timothy instructions. You can see this here in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. He says this, Therefore, I want the, say it out loud with me, I want the men everywhere to pray and to do what? Lift up holy hands without anger and dispute. I want the men to lift up holy hands. Now, sometimes in the Bible, when the word man is used, it means everybody. It means mankind. This is not the case here. Paul literally is speaking about the XY chromosome, right? He's talking about men. And Paul says, I want men to lift up holy hands. And I don't know why for sure. I can't prove this. But based on my experience, men are typically the last ones to do that. Men are typically the last ones to do this. Maybe because it's pride. Maybe because it feels awkward. Maybe they think it's a girl's thing to do and not a man thing. But for whatever reason, Paul says this, I want men to lift up hands to God. If I had to make a guess, I'm guessing that Paul wants men to set the standard for worship. Amen? Paul wants the man to be the leader in their home. Paul wants children to see their fathers seeking the heart of God. If you want your children to seek after God, you need to be the one that seeks after God first. Amen? We need to set the standard. And so, I want to say to the men of our church this morning, don't you dare let your wives out-worship you. Don't let your children out-worship you. You set the stone, you set the tone, you seek God. You be the man after God's own heart. I'm going to give away a little bit of the end of our service here. We're going to sing a song. And I want the men to be the first ones to lead up their hands in worship. It's going to be an experience, uh, experiment, okay? And it's going to be awkward. Listen, and if you feel awkward about it, just close your eyes and it'll go a lot easier, right? But I want the men to set the pace when we do that. So why would God ask us to lift up holy hands? Why is it that God wants us to lift our hands from him? And some of this is speculation on my part. Uh, after exploring uh, scripture. So being a dad for the first time, how many dads are in here? Go ahead and raise your hand, okay? You had the privilege of seeing your wife bear children, all right? This may be hard for some of you to believe this, but when it came to being a dad, I was a little nervous myself. Any dads out there were a little nervous about being a dad for the first time? George, I think you're shaking your hand, all right? Um, like, we, we don't even know what to do. You know, all of a sudden, we're like, cavemen, ugh, I, don't, I can break. You know, like, we have, we, you know, my, my, my fingers are going to scratch the baby, you know? Um, and and even, even earlier, we, we were joking, men don't know stats, Right? Um, I met with Matt Elizabeth on Monday night to pray with them before they went into the hospital on Tuesday. And as I'm talking with them, I realized I didn't even know what the sex of the baby was. Like I had to ask them, I was like, oh, is, is it going to be a boy or a girl? And they just looked at me and I'm like, I didn't go to the bridal shower, you know, or not bridal shower, the baby shower. I don't know the, I mean, I even, I visited them on Wednesday and if someone was to ask me on Thursday how long the baby was, Dan, I wouldn't know. I didn't even know how long my own babies were. They're like this now. Okay. But, but let me tell you this. As much apprehension I had before becoming a dad. And, and when you have that baby in your hands for the first time, right? Right? And as you see that baby grow and they're starting to, you know, do the Frankenstein, right? 
as they're starting to, to walk and they look at you and they outstretch their arms towards you, right? Dad is a big bowl of mush. And there's this pride that wells up and there's this love. And I, I, they say, Dada, and I'm done. And then I just think about the love of our Heavenly Father as much as, as if, if we feel like that with our children, how much more does God feel like that when his children outstretch their arms to him? I want you to turn to James chapter 4, verse 8, or you can see this in the bulletin there. James chapter 4, this 8, it says, draw near to God and what will he do? Say it with me, church. He will draw near to you. You know, when, when we sit there and we say, God, this is the best I can do, and I feel like I can't reach you, but, but I learn and I read from Scripture that, that you're always paying attention and that nothing escapes you. You're unchanging and you're present everywhere, and I'm reaching out to you. I can't imagine. God draws near to us when we draw near to him. Amen. I believe God loves it. I believe it's an offering of praise. Today, we almost missed the offering, okay? Uh, not exactly, I guess, hitting on all eight cylinders this morning, right? So we almost missed the offering. Listen, as much as offering is an offering, okay, it's an offering of praise, let me say this. Your outstretched arms, your raising your hands is a offering to God. Psalm 141 verses 1 and 2. Oh Lord, I'm calling on you. Please hurry. Listen when I cry to you for help. Accept my prayer as an incense offering to you and with my upraised hand as an evening offering. I absolutely love this. I'm praying and I please accept what I'm giving to you as an offering. I love you and I need you. Some of you today, this will be the very first time that you've ever given an offering of lifted hands to God. And it may feel a bit awkward at first. It may feel like you're kind of being pushed out of your comfort zone. And as your pastor, I'm saying this, it's okay to be pushed out of your comfort zone. Just lift them up and say, God, I'm offering my heart to you. And I believe God will be pleased. We lift up our hands to God because God loves it. We lift up our hands to him because it's an offering of praise. We lift up our hands because reaching out to him, he will draw near to us and, he, and we draw near to him. Another reason that we lift our hands to God is because we're declaring battle. And we need God's help. Some of you right now, you may be in a place where you're in a real battle. And I mean a real battle. A real dark place. And if things don't change, you're not going to know what to do and what to do next. Maybe this morning you're going to lift up your hands and you're going to say, God, I'm declaring battle and I need help of the all-powerful God to do battle with me and to do battle for me. In fact, I want to give you a final example this morning in Scripture. It's out of Exodus chapter 17. The Malachites are attacking the Israelites. And so Moses said to Joshua, Joshua, choose some men we're going to battle. They've declared war against us and we're going to push back. And Moses says, tomorrow, I'm going to stand on top of that mountain and I'm going to lift my hands to God and I'm going to pray to him. And here's what scripture says in verse 10 and 11. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. And as long as Moses did what? Say it out loud. As long as Moses held up his hands, what happened? They, had, they were winning, and when, when he didn't, when he lowered his hand, what happened? They were losing. 
I want you to see something. Ready? Say it with me. When my hands are raised, he was winning. When his hands were down, he was losing, right? Winning, losing. You would get it? God's people were winning as long as Moses' hands were able to stay up high. Here's the reality. Some of you right now, you're in a battle and it feels like you're losing. Can I suggest something to you? You need to raise your hands in worship. You need to raise your hands in worship and declare battle and say, God, I can't do this on my own. I need to depend on you to do the work for me. Whenever Moses' hands grew tired, guess what? And, and, and it's hard, right? How many of you ever tried to leave your hands up for a long period of time? Dan, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> right? They get tired. Verse 12. When his hands grew tired, they took a stone and they put it underneath him and he sat on it. Aaron and her, his two friends did what? They they held up his hands, one on one side and one on the other, so that their hands remained steady until sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Dan, Dan and Mike, can you guys come up here real quick? Good, you're on the right side. No, 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 you got to stay on this side. This is your good arm. Okay? All right, Mike, come on over this way. I, I called these two guys up because... Uh, They're faithful to hold me up before the Lord, and they hold up my hands. I, I talk to these guys pretty frequently. We talk all the time. We text, we call, and uh, each one of them shares with me very frequently that they're praying for me. And what they're doing, go ahead. You can grab my arms. This is what they're doing. Even when I get tired, right, they're holding up my hands. Guys, I appreciate it. And I thank you for praying for me. Amen? Hey, let's give these guys a good round of applause. Thanks a lot. Love you guys. All right? <laughs> thank you. Appreciate you. Um, those guys do it all the time. Uh, they tell me about it, and I know they do it because I see their prayers answered. When I lose faith, it's what, it's what happens. The body of Christ surrounds one another and lifts one another up. Listen, gang, I want you to understand that this morning. This is why church is important. This is why church is important. In Ephesians, it says we are to build up. We are to edify the body of Christ. This is why, listen, and some of you guys are hurting and you have people that you know that are outside the church and you're hurting and your first response to them is this, I need to get you around a bunch of people who are going to build you up and who are to lift up your hands. Amen? Because it works. That's what the church does. The church worships God. It believes in God. And we believe this without a shadow of a doubt that God changes people's lives. Amen? Listen, I, I'm not concerned about conformity to a bunch of spiritual rules. I'm not. That's not what makes a man spiritual. What makes a man spiritual is the fact that they know and they trust in Jesus and they believe in him and they see him working every single day in their life and they know without a shadow of a doubt that he loves them. That's the purpose of the church. We are to worship him and we are to show other people about Jesus. Some of you are in a battle right now. You're in a battle and it's time to declare to God, God, I need you. And you're going to put your hands up. You're going to put your hands up. God, I need you. I want you to think about this. Throughout history, what has uplifted hands meant? Two things, right? When someone raised their hand, first of all, how many of you ever gone to a sports, sporting event? And when your team scores a goal, what do you do? Right? You get excited. It's victory. Now, 
If somebody is holding a gun at you, what do you do? I surrender. Don't shoot, right? This is it. In Christianity, in the presence of God, holding up your hands is both those things. Holding up your hands is both those things. At that moment, you surrender to him, but you find victory in him. In that moment, you surrender to him, but you also find victory in him. Two hands raised. You find surrender, and you find victory. Oh, I can preach about that for a long time, right? So here's what we're going to do. I know we're running late, and I apologize about that, but this is important. Here's all I I want you to do an experiment with me, okay? We're going to sing that joy to the world song, okay? And would you stand with me? And would you just lift your hands in worship during that song? Would you lift your hands in worship during that song? And trust me, listen, if it feels awkward, close your eyes and imagine you're the only one in here, okay? But let's worship God this morning with lifted hands.